Hi, very good morning. I am Dr. Janak Patel, MD, general physician. All my video lectures are mainly for educative purpose. In continuity with the previous lectures, today we will be dealing with examination of pupil, pupillary reflex and different abnormalities while checking pupillary reflex or we call light reflex and also it will be including with accommodation response etc. So pupillary reflex means it is a part of second cranial nerve as a sensory pathway and a motor pathway is by third cranial nerve. So first before we do a pupillary reflex we always examine for the size of the pupil we compare the two sides and then we go for the pupillary reflex and then we try to identify is there any abnormality, where is the lesion, etc. So we'll be going through that one by one. We call pupillary reflex or a light reflex. So introduction, pathway, methods, interpretations and different types of pupils and pupillary reflex. So we'll be talking of pupillary reflex, introduction pathway, what is pupillary reflex, interpretation, etc. Followed by accommodation response, convergence reflex, ciliospinal reflex. And then we'll be talking of different types of pupil which are very frequently asked as a short note. So we'll be talking on that part. So pupil is an aperture of diaphragm of eye that is iris that allows the light to enter eyeball and fall on retina. So it is the central part of the iris through which the light is allowed to fall on retina. And pupil size increases and decreases because of two fibers. One we call circular fibers and second we call perpendicular fiber. Circular fiber is supplied by parasympathetic fiber from Edinburgh Westphal nucleus of third cranial nerve and perpendicular fibers or we call dilator pupillary fiber they are supplied by sympathetic fiber that will increase the size of the pupil and will allow more light to fall on retina. So pupil is controlled by two system which is autonomic nervous system, one parasympathetic fiber from the third cranial nerve that is from Edinburgh Westphal nucleus of third cranial nerve and from sympathetic fiber which is supplying a dilator pupillae while parasympathetic fiber of third cranial nerve will be controlling the constrictor pupillae fibers that is circular fibers. So indirectly the pupil size will allow the light to enter the retina and fall on retina. So it will increase and decrease the aperture of pupil or indirectly we call the size of the pupil. So in a dark pupil will be dilated, in a bright light pupil will be constricted. So this is the normal response what is there in any normal person. So in a normal person the pupil size is roughly 2 to 4 millimeter in diameter in presence of bright light to a darkness. So in darkness the pupil size will become 4 to 8 while in a bright light it will be 2 to 4 millimeter in size. So when the light falls on retina you will get constriction of pupil that is a direct response because light is falling directly on the retina. If the light falls on say right eye and left pupil constricts that is called consensual reflex or that is called indirect reflex. So pupil will dilate in dark constrict in presence of bright light as well as when a person tries to look at the distant object and when he tries to look at the near object, 
that is called accommodation response both eyeball will converge and pupil will constrict this is called accommodative response we'll be talking in detail as we go through so there will be two types of fiber sphincter pupillae or constrictor pupillae or we call circular fibers dilator pupillae or we call perpendicular fibers so there are two types of fiber sphincter pupillae will decrease the size of the pupil while perpendicular fiber or dilator pupillary fiber will dilate the pupil or will increase the size of the pupil pupil and will allow more light to fall on retina and that will be very peculiar in presence of darkness so there are, will be two types of fiber circular fiber will be controlled by parasympathetic fiber which is arising from edinburgh vespal nucleus of a third cranial nerve while sympathetic fiber will be from cervical area and that will be supplying the perpendicular fibers so there will be two groups of fiber so in bright light pupil will constrict in a dim light or we call darkness pupil will dilate and that will be done by sympathetic while constriction will be done by parasympathetic and both pupil will be of equal size so we always look for size shape equality and position so we'll be just showing you some of those particular thing the normal size is between 2 mm to 4 mm and maximum dilatation will be around 6 mm in normal lights so we have already shown you before this is the size of the pupil what will be there in darkness it can dilate up to 8 mm while in a bright light the size may be 2 mm to 4 mm so indirectly we say that if the pupil size is markedly less than 2 mm we call myotic pupil while if it is more than 8 mm we'll call that as dilated pupil or midriasis so these are the two common words which will be utilized pinpoint pupil we call myotic pupil and fully dilated pupil we will call as a midriatic pupil normal shape is round the margin are smooth and it is absolutely regular and both side pupil will be equal in size equal in shape and position wise it will be exactly in the center but you can have a abnormal position of the pupil which which is usually described as correctopia or eccentric pupil will be showing you some of those and if the two pupils are unequal say one is of 2 mm and another is 6 mm then we use that word anisocoria so we'll be using all those words normally you will have all, always only one pupil very rarely you have got more than one we call polychoria location usually central but if it is peripheral then it is called eccentric or it is called correctopia and we have already mentioned the size of the pupil you divide into two normal or abnormal abnormal can be myotic or midriatic so normal pupil is usually central round and reacts to light abnormal pupil will be unequal dilated or constricted not reacting to light or irregular in shape and not central so whenever it is unequal if it is dilated or constricted if it is not reacting to light and if it is a irregular shape and if it is not central we always call that as abnormal you can see here this is a defects in a pupil that is in iris and that is producing almost we call key hole appearance this is called coloboma so shape of the pupil is normal circular irregular shape will be because of iridocyclitis very very common following an inflammation of iris you can have foot and pupil irregular shape patchy dilatation etc so you can have that because of fibrosis 
if you get a congenital defect usually we call that as a coloboma we have already shown you one picture of that because of iris inflammation trauma or say like argal robertson pupil you will have a irregular shaped pupil a fixed oval pupil is associated with severe pain and red eye so you can have an abnormal shape of the pupil we'll be showing you some of those shapes now if the two pupils are not equal we usually use the word anisocoria when both are equal shape we call that as a normal say one is small and one is dilated we call anisocoria if both are pinpoint we call meiosis if both are equally dilated we call midriasis so if it is pinpoint the another word for meiotic pupil we call microcoria if it is dilated we call as a megalocoria if two are not equal one is small size and another is dilated we call anisocoria if there are more than one pupil we call as a polycoria and if pupil is eccentric or peripheral we call correctopia these are few words you try to remember it may help you out in oral exams now if unequal pupil you can see here this is unequal pupil this is pin point so this is meiosis this is a little bigger size or almost we can call as normal size so we'll call that as a unequal pupil we'll always call anisocoria and if you see the color is different then it is called heterocropia so that is different color of iris so that is called heterocoria heterochromia sorry not coria heterochromia so this is poly more than one pupil polycoria eccentric pupil correctopia so this is eccentric pupil correctopia and you can see there is one these are more than two so this is polycoria and there are multiple pupils and you can see there are multiple cornea this is one cornea this is second cornea now you can see here this is fully dilated this is coloboma all these are congenital so bilateral absence of pupil if it is not pupil is not seen at all will call as an iridia an means absent and iridia means absence of iris bilateral absence of iris hence there will be no pupil bilateral absence of pupil will call that as an iridia if there is abnormal shape of the pupil and there is an absence of part of the pupil partial partial then it is usually we use the word coloboma and if the central part of the pupil is white in color white pupil then it is called leucocoria it is very big commonly because of congenital cataract and another common disorders is retinoblastoma if person has got tumor like retinoblastoma or person has got congenital cataract the central part of the pupil will appear white and this will be very common in children and we call that as a leucocoria among acquired group pseudo exfoliation syndrome i don't know much in detail regarding that but it is a gray white fibrogranular extracellular matrix material deposited on anterior surface of the lens so that is called pseudo exfoliation sphincter tear due to trauma so that is a traumatic injury leading to a tear this is not coloboma an irregular shape pupil because of inflammation and that is called synechia you can see abnormal color two abnormal color so this will be heterochromia this will be congenital 
irregular pupil in case of iridocyclitis. You can see the margin is irregular. It is not round and smooth. This is abnormal shape of the pupil. This will be in an animal. This is rectangular shape. This is little elongated shape in different animals. These are all the different shapes of pupil in different animals. Now, while assessing a pupillary reflex, we do different reflexes. One we do is light reflex or we call pupillary reflex or light reflex. And in that we do two parts, direct reflex, consensual reflex. And then we also look at the pupillary size, changing in the pupil size with swinging flashlight. And then we look at the near reflexes test, what we call as convergence reflex or accommodation reflex. So these are the three part components we usually check. Light reflex, we call pupillary reflex, where we do direct and consensual reflex. We also do what is called swinging flash light reflex, mainly to identify some of the disorders like Marcus gun reflex, etc. And we also look for accommodation response or we call near response or convergence response. And that we also use the word near reflex test or near response or accommodation response or convergence response. These are the three common words which are being utilized or we call near reflex. So these are the different tests. We'll be going one by one. Only when, whenever we suspect sympathetic system damage, particularly in case of Horner syndrome, we do ciliospinal reflex to find out is there any damage to sympathetic system. In Horner syndrome, because of damage to the sympathetic fiber, you will have an absence of ciliospinal reflex. Means when you pinch the skin in the neck, give noxious stimulus to the skin the pupil in the neck you pinch the skin the pupil on the same side will dilate if it doesn't dilate it is called ciliospinal reflex is absent and that will be because of damage to the sympathetic fiber which is supplying perpendicular fiber of the iris so that we'll be talking in the last part so that is called ciliospinal reflex at present just i have mentioned so ciliospinal reflex is dilation of the pupil on painful stimulus to ipsilateral neck. While oculosensory or oculopupillary reflex is constriction or dilatation followed by constriction on painful stimulus to the eye or its adnexa. This is called oculosensory or oculopupillary reflex. Usually we never do that, but it is an important reflex. So either there is a constriction or dilation followed by constriction of the painful stimulus on painful stimulus to the eye. So if there is a painful stimulus, usually pupil will constrict. So in that, if it is followed by constriction or dilatation, we will call that as oculopupillary reflex is preserved. There is another reflex called as a plitz westphal reaction. We are not interested in much. Cochlear pupillary reflex or vestibular pupillary reflex, we are also not interested in this reflexes. Mainly we are interested in ciliospinal reflexes. So we'll be going through what we call a pupillary reflex or direct reflex, where we explain the person how we do the test. After explaining a person, then we do the test. Means when we throw the light on the eye and the same side pupil constrict, we call direct reflex is present and opposite eye where we have not thrown the light and if that is constricting we call consensual reflex or indirect pupillary reflex is present so these are the two common words which are being utilized either we call consensual or indirect reflex and direct reflex so we'll be going through the pathway and then you will be understanding what exactly is happening so in a diagram we'll be showing you so sensory pathway is second cranial now motor pathway is third cranial now center is in the upper part of midbrain and the muscles which will be giving a response will be muscles in the iris we call perpendicular fiber and constrictor fibers mainly constrictor fiber will be giving a response while doing a pupillary reflex so that will be in pupillary reflex so parasympathetic fiber that is edinburgh westphal nucleus of third cranial nerve 
will be giving rise to the fiber which will supply constrictor fiber or circular fiber or we call sphincter pupillary fibers and so whenever light falls on second cranial nerve that is retina part it will give rise to same side third cranial nerve stimulation and pupil will constrict this is called direct pupillary reflex and whenever you stimulate the skin part that is the sympathetic system is stimulated the same side sympathetic fiber will stimulate the perpendicular fiber or dilateral pupil and pupil will dilate so this will be pupillary reflex will be now going through that so parasympathetic fiber first order neurons from retina to the pretectal nucleus then from pretectal nucleus to edinburgh vespal nucleus is called second order neuron then from edinburgh vespal nucleus you will have a fiber which will be going to same side as well as opposite side so it is a bilateral innervation and it will be innervating ciliary ganglia that is third order neuron where you will have synapse and from that ciliary ganglia the fiber will supply we call sphincter pupillary fiber or circular fiber or pu constrictor pupillary fibers via short ciliary nerve so these are the four groups of fiber first order neuron second order neuron third order neuron and fourth order neuron so this depending upon where is the damage accordingly we'll get the finding as far as pupillary reflex is concerned now just very simple way to understand when the light falls on say left eye from left eye the impulse will travel along the optic nerve will go to the optic chiasma then it will cross at the level of optic chiasma to optic tract it will end in a pretectal nucleus from pretectal nucleus now second order neuron will start that will go to edinburgh vespal nucleus and edinburgh vespal nucleus will innervate both that is it will innervate the oculomotor nerve and through oculomotor nerve it will be giving fiber to both sides ciliary ganglia both sides ciliary ganglia so say this will supply right as well as left both side and from ciliary ganglia now fourth order neuron will start and that will go to what we call is a constrictor pupillary and this will give rise to same side direct light reflex and opposite eye constriction we call is a consensual light reflex or indirect light reflex so these are the two words which will be very frequently being utilized so this is a classical pathway of pupillary reflex or we call light reflex so here it is explained a simple way light falls on retina will pass through the optic nerve optic tract superior colliculus of both side then pretectal nucleus it will innervate the edinburgh vespal and from edinburgh vespal it will go to ciliary ganglia then sphincter pupillary and you will get constriction so this is called pupillary pathway so if you just see here this will be pretectal nucleus pretectal nucleus this is the oculomotor this pretectal nucleus of say this is the left side it is supplying left oculomotor as well as right oculomotor they supplying both so you will see that particular innervation how exactly it is going say this stimulus from retina will pass through optic nerve optic chiasma optic tract lateral geniculate body from that the fiber will go to the pretectal nucleus from pretectal nucleus to the oculomotor nerve of both side or we call third cranial nerve of both side so it will innervate both and from there now you can see the fiber it is innervating both and same side fiber will go to the ciliary ganglia of same side and innervate the constrictor fiber and opposite side will go to opposite side ciliary ganglia and then short ciliary now it will innervate the opposite side same means opposite side of constrictor fibers so again if you want to see this is a little enlarged so this will be a stimulus of the retina 
will pass through optic nerve optic chiasma may go to the opposite side if the nasal fibers are stimulated if temporal fibers are stimulated it will go to the same side so after going there it will end in lateral geniculate which will give a second order neuron which will end in a pretectal nucleus from pretectal nucleus it will go to the oculomotor this will be a third order neuron first order second order third order and then this will be a fourth order so this will be first second third order and then this will be a fourth order so that fiber will end in a ciliary ganglia and from that it will go to the constrictor pupillae for fibers so when light is falling here this will be the pathway so it is falling on the left eye so left eye nasal fiber fiber will cross to the opposite side in optic chiasma so it will go to opposite side lateral geniculate body opposite side pretractal nucleus opposite eye as well as same side third cranial nerve ciliary ganglia constrictor pupillae so both side will constrict and so when light is falling on the left retina and you get a constriction of left pupil it is direct pupillary reflex and opposite eye constrict it is indirect pupillary reflex by and large when we throw the light we usually throw the light from lateral side so usually it falls on the nasal retina as far as the sympathetic pathway is concerned we have already told you that first order neuron in sympathetic pathway will start from hypothalamus and will go to cervical 8 and t1 t2 area that is called ciliospinal center and it will be uncrossed in a brain stem it will be uncrossed in the brain stem then from there the second order neuron means it will be on the running on the same side from now that what we call as lateral horns of spinal cord ciliospinal center of bulb to superior cervical ganglia so fiber will go to the superior cervical ganglia there it will make a synapse so this will become a second order neuron now third order neuron will start from the superior cervical ganglia and it will run along internal carotid artery in a what we call as shit carotid shit it will enter in the cranial fossa to the jugular foramen via jugular foramen and it will end into a dilator pupillary fibers so this will be third order neurons so if you look here the fiber will start from the hypothalamus will come to the cervical c8 t1 t2 from that lateral horns now the sympathetic fiber will come out it will end in this is called sympathetic ganglia and from that sympathetic ganglia you will get the third order neuron and it will supply what we call as dilator pupil as well as it is going to supply extraocular muscle and also it will supply molar muscle so this sympathetic system will supply molar muscle dilator pupillary of iris and it will be by a long ciliary fibers long ciliary nerve and it will also supply little amount of fiber to the extraocular muscles also and this will be very important in horner syndrome so either because of damage in the hypothalamus or in this fibers we call central fibers or second order neuron we call preganglionic fibers or postganglionic fibers you will ever finding depending upon which level the damage is so if there is a damage at the level of postganglionic fiber you will have dilator pupillary being affected you might have even fiber which is supplying molar muscle will be also affected and that will be discussing in detail in a horner syndrome so first how you start examining a person 
when you start examining a person first let the person look straight both pupil both eye are open you look at the size of the pupil in both eye if it is unequal we call anisocoria if both are equal normal at the same time when you are looking at the pupil you look at the ptosis part you look at the eyelids upper eyelid lower eyelids you look at the position of eyebrows you look at the axis of both eyeball is there any nystagmus or we call strabismus is there any ptosis is there any nystagmus is there any strabismus is there any ptosis you look for all those things so that will be one part which will you be looking for and whenever he is looking at a distant object usually during a day time there will be a bright light and in presence of bright light both pupil will be pinpoint and you look for both side pupil size shape and symmetry and second thing what you can do without throwing a light put off the light shut off the light in the room so you make the room dark and now look at the size shape and symmetry so this should be done without throwing a light now while doing a pupillary reflex you have first explain the person you can see here a person is putting a hand on one side so that the light cannot fall on opposite eye you are throwing a bright light which will fall in this eye over the cornea and light will travel through the cornea anterior chamber through the pupil lens vitreous chamber and then it will fall on the retina as soon as it falls on the retina that side retina is stimulated it will pass through optic nerve optic chiasma optic tract it will end in lateral geniculate body from there into pretectal nucleus from pretectal nucleus it will be bilateral innervation of both third cranial nerve that is oculomotor nerve and that will be present in the midbrain upper part of midbrain and from oculomotor nerve that is edinburgh westphal nucleus the fiber will start they will end in ciliary ganglia and from ciliary ganglia short ciliary nerve will supply constrictor pupillary fiber of iris so when you throw the light on one side that's why this is the word which is being utilized now before we go to that particular part this is pupil equal regular reacting to light and accommodation response and this is called marcus gun pupil that is you do by swinging light reflex we'll be talking separately so normal pupil we call p is for pupil e is equal r for round and we also use a word shape that is round shape and margin are clear and rla is response to light reflex and accommodation response so this is response to light reflex and accommodation response and m is marcus gun response in a normal person it is negative so these are the words which are being utilized so in norm any normal person both pupils are equal round margins are smooth it is responsive to light and there is also a normal response to accommodation response and it is negative for marcus gun response and that we call as normal pupil so we write down p e r r l a and then dash m g that is pupil equal round regular or we call smooth margin reacting to light and reacting to accommodation response so p e r r l a and then we write down dash negative for marcus gun response so first you examine externally look at the eyebrow eyelids cornea position of the eyeball pupil size equal or not round or not margins are regular or not and then we check for pupillary reflex and we look at the size of the pupil in dark as well as in bright light and after 
completing that we have explained the person we put the hand over the central part of the head and then we throw the light on one side from laterally and light should be bright enough and it should fall on cornea as soon as the light falls on cornea from cornea it will travel through anterior chamber pupil posterior chamber that is lens vitreous humor and it will fall on retina now at this stage if there is anything which hampers the light transmission to fall on retina like corneal opacity something in anterior chamber like hyphema or there is a pus in anterior chamber if pupil is absolutely pinpoint and there is cataract or there is some opacity in vitreous humor etc it will be very difficult to elicit the pupillary reflex person can have difficulty in eliciting the pupillary reflex now we take it for granted everything is normal if the light falls on retina that side pupil will constrict because light will travel through the second cranial nerve sensory pathway and via the third cranial nerve motor pathway you will have a constricted pupillary constriction and you will have a pupil constriction and that we call as direct pupillary reflex at the same time as from the pretectal nucleus the fiber is going to the same side third cranial nerve as well as to the opposite side third cranial nerve so opposite side third cranial nerve is also stimulated and that will stimulate opposite side constrictor fibers and opposite side without a light also that pupil constrict we call that as a indirect reflex or consensual pupillary reflex when this is present we say second cranial nerve on the right side is normal and third cranial nerve on both side is normal so this is very very simple and once you demonstrate similar thing is repeated on opposite eye and then we go for a swinging flashlight response ciliospinal response and accommodation response we'll be talking regarding these three that is swinging flash flashlight ciliospinal reflex and accommodation response later on as we go through so this is you can see the bright light here you will have constrictor pupillary response here we call direct pupillary reflex at the same time in opposite eye also you will get constriction of the pupil that is called consensual or indirect pupillary response so sensory pathway second cranial nerve efferent pathway third cranial nerve and the response will be constriction of pupil of same side direct opposite eye indirect or we call consensual pupillary reflex you can see here you are testing only one eye this is direct pupillary reflex you are testing and when you throw the light here and opposite eye also constrict that is indirect or consensual pupillary reflex here you can see you are eliciting direct pupillary reflex by throwing a bright light and indirect means you throw the light here you look for constriction on this eye we call indirect pupillary reflex now very 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 simple so when you are throwing the light here impulse will travel lateral geniculate body pretectal nucleus both third cranial nerve stimulated direct pupillary reflex this will give rise to constriction of opposite side indirect pupillary reflex clear so when this pupil constrict direct this constrict indirect or we call consensual pupillary reflex now at this stage only we'll explain suppose if there is a damage to either this eye retina or optic nerve or optic tract or there is a damage to optic chiasma or lateral geniculate body on say right side say we take it for granted here on the right side so if i say here it is left eye so we'll talk of left eye so if there is a damage to left side optic nerve optic chiasma and optic tract so when light falls here impulse cannot travel to pretectal nucleus because this is damage either at optic nerve or optic tract means light falls here 
I will not have direct pupillary reflex as well as indirect pupillary reflex will be also absent. Very clear. Now suppose if I have got the damage in lateral geniculate body, same. Because impulse is coming here, then it is activating pretectal nucleus and then you are getting bilateral innervation. So direct will be also absent, indirect will be also absent. If I've got a damage in pretectal nucleus on say left side, again direct as well as indirect will be absent. But say I've got the damage in the third cranial nerve on left side. Now this is not innervating the opposite eye. Hence, I will have only absence of direct reflex on right side. But if this is normal and it comes to pretectal nucleus, this is damage. So this will not be stimulated. You will have a direct pupillary reflex absent, but opposite eye pupillary reflex is preserved. That means second cranial nerve on this side is normal, pretectal nucleus is normal, and opposite eye, third cranial nerve nucleus is also normal. Very simple. Now suppose if I throw the light here, and if I'm putting a, any particular hardboard or a hand, so that light doesn't fall on opposite eye. And opposite eye, this side direct pupillary reflex is preserved. Opposite eye, indirect is absent. When it will be absent? If I've got a damage in the third cranial nerve. Very clear? So do understand this part. So if opposite side indirect pupillary reflex is absent and direct pupillary reflex on the same side is preserved means same side second and third cranial nerves are intact. Opposite side, third cranial nerve damage. If direct is absent on the same side, indirect is preserved, means same side, third cranial nerve palsy. If I have got direct absent and indirect also absent on opposite side, but if I throw the light on opposite eye, direct is preserved and I get indirect on left side, normal, consensual reflex. That means opposite side second cranial nerve is normal. Opposite side optic nerve, optic tract, lateral geniculate body, pretectal nucleus, and third cranial nerve is normal. Very clear. That means left side third cranial nerve is being affected. So this is a very simple diagram. You will be able to understand very clearly. So all those possible things are being, this is a pathway which has been already we have explained before. And I just explained you what will happen if there is a damage at different level. So same side direct reflex present normal. If it is absent, so there is a damage either to the third cranial nerve or second cranial nerve or in a midbrain pretectal nucleus damage, right? Or third cranial nerve right from the midbrain up to ciliary ganglia. Direct is absent, but opposite eye indirect is present. That means same side only third cranial nerve palsy right from midbrain up to iris direct reflex of opposite eye is also absent that means same side second cranial nerve is damaged so up to pretectal nucleus it is working or there is a damage to midbrain part of pretectal nucleus so both side direct as well as indirect will be absent so either there is a damage to the second cranial nerve or from lateral geniculate body fiber, which we call is a second order neuron fiber, which is going to the pretector, those are being damaged. So in that case, direct as well as indirect, both will be absent. Now direct is present. Opposite side. Direct is absent. So opposite side, third cranial nerve is gone. Say you are throwing a light on the left eye, left eye direct is preserved, opposite side indirect is absent. So opposite side third cranial nerve is affected, very clear. If same side in a bright light, it is fully dilated, that side is fully dilated, means second cranial nerve is damaged and if it is pinpoint in a dark room, means in a dark usually it should be dilated but instead of that it is a pinpoint in a dark room 
it will usually suggest sympathetic damage or we call classical example Horner's syndrome. So if it is unequal, we call it the anisophoria. So this is normal. Both pupils are equal and constricted. You can see here when you are throwing the light, this is constricted, but this is dilated. So this will indicate this side. This side, you are not thrown the light, but still it is dilated. Means constricted pupil is not working. So third cranial lobe pulsing. Loss of consensual pupillary light reflects this side, third cranial lobe pulsing. And when you throw the light here, pupil does not constrict, means sensory pathway is being damaged. Or, but opposite side pupil is constricted, means second cranial nerve. Loss of direct pupillary reflex. So, this will suggest third cranial nerve palsy on same side. Third cranial lobe palsy on same side if opposite pupil constrict. But if opposite pupil also does not respond, then it is suggestive of second cranial lobe palsy. So you should look for also consensual pupillary reflex. That will be very, very important. So both equal size pupil on bilateral side, isochoria. If unequal pupil, anisochoria. So no response very frequently because of the second cranial nerve damage or head injury affecting the oculomotor nerve. If you get ptosis along with pupillary changes, it will be almost almost in favor of oculomotor nerve palsy. Oculomotor nerve palsy, very very common. So communicating artery, we are not going in Horner syndrome, the side where it is, it will be a pinpoint pupil. It will be a pinpoint pupil. So loss of sympathetic means dilation is absent. So you will have a pinpoint pupil that will be very characteristic of a Horner syndrome with partial ptosis. With partial ptosis. Now we will be talking little bit regarding a Marcus gun pupil, or it is also we use a word for that Marcus gun pupil, RAPD. Relative afferent pupillary defect. What is afferent? And what is efferent? Also known as Marcus gun pupil. Means sensory. Relative afferent sensory. Efferent is going out. Afferent means going towards. So that is sensory. So it is relative afferent pupillary defects. How exactly it will happen? It is used to compare direct and consensual light reflex. It is performed by equal exposure of light to each eye. Normally both pupils should be of the same size and constricted when you throw the light. So if I throw the light here, both should constrict. And if I just move the light away from, so both should equally dilate also. So normally both pupils should be of the same size and constricted. Abnormally, if the pupil dilates, means if I am throwing the light, instead of constriction, it is just dilating with swinging light. We call that as relative afferent pupillary defect. And that is characteristic of a Marcus gun pupil. We will be showing you in a next slide. So you can see here. This, both pupils are of equal size. When light falls on normal eye, both are equal in size, both are 2 millimeter. When light on eye with afferent defects, so you can see here, there will be decreased reaction of both pupils. But when you do the swinging light reflex, you will see that when you throw the light, If you see just when even if, if the light is thrown, the pupil is dilated. This is swinging light. This is what is happening in a normal. This is in a normal. You have to cover the eye. So swinging flash light when pupil exhibits relative afferent pupillary defect. It is described as a Markan pupil. It suggests 
optic nerve disease central retinal artery etc mainly it is because of the optic nerve disease and maybe also occurs in amblyopia so that is marcus can pupil now you will be able to see here so you are throwing the light here so this should constrict and this should also constrict but when you are throwing a light here you can see that pupil is dilated it is not constricting that means there is something happening to the optic nerve and this is a characteristic of marcus can pupil the cause of marcus can pupil most common is optic neuritis which is very commonly in multiple sclerosis and diabetes mellitus this is the most common we forget about all other you can see in sometime in glaucoma or because of optic nerve tumor or because of compressive optic neuropathy or anterior ischemic neuropathy basically because of damage to optic nerve this is shown normal afferent pupillary defects or we call rapd that is relative afferent pupillary reflex relative afferent pupillary defect so this is rapd and short we call as a marcus can pupil rapd relative afferent pupillary defect or it is also just labeled as afferent pupillary defect along with swinging light with a fixed and dilated pupil you can see this is almost fixed and dilated and that is very very severe so that will happen very peculiar so marcus gun pupil or afferent pupillary defect or it is also called rapd interpretation of light reflex we already discussed that particular now we come to what we call is accommodation response or near response or accommodation reflex so these are the different things which are being labeled near reflex near response accommodation response accommodation reflex all are one in the same and there are basically three components what we do we ask the person to look at the distant object and then suddenly look at the near object that is finger close to the nose or at the nose tip when a person is looking at the distance object two eyes axis is parallel so first always you try to rule out strabismus and when the person is looking at the distant object usually pupil is almost we call same size and equal now when you ask the person to look at the near object close to the nose which is we are keeping between the two eye by and large we call tip of the nose or we could put a finger very close to the nose both eyeball will converge so the first component is convergence of the eyeball second component is constriction of the pupil pupil will constrict because person wants to look at the near object and third part curvature of the lens which we cannot examine changes so lens becomes little thicker to increase the power of lens so that the light falls exactly on the retina now this third component we cannot examine but these two component we can examine that is change in the pupil size and change in the position of the eyeball that is convergence and constriction this is labeled as accommodation response or near response or near reflex these are the different words so we are not going into detail at present regarding this so whenever the person is asked to look at the near object there is a constriction of pupil and there is a convergence so two things are happening together and that we call as accommodation reflex so simultaneously there is increased curvature of the lens that is a third component increase curvature of the lens convergence and constriction of the pupil so convergence of the eyeball constriction of the pupil 
and plus change in the curvature. So three components. This is mentioned together. So convergence, constriction of the pupil and increase in the curvature of the lens. Together we call accommodation reflex. This is in detail the pathway of accommodation response. I'm not going in detail at present. At your leisure time, you can go through. In routine lecture, if time permits, we'll be explaining you that. So I'm just skipping over this particular part. So this is a pathway of accommodation response. We get ciliary muscle, that is change in the lens, sphincter pupillae, constriction, and medial rectus, convergence. Three things together. So convergence, constriction, and lens size will change. Three components, pupillary constriction, convergence, and increase in the convexity of the lens. That is accommodation response. This third part we cannot examine. We can examine these two parts. So just this is for light falls, lateral geniculate body. From lateral geniculate body, the fiber will go to the pretectal nucleus. From pretectal nucleus, it will go to oculomotor that is for pupillary reflex. While if the fiber from lateral geniculate body goes to the occipital lobe, and from occipital lobe, the fiber comes to oculomotor. That is via superior longitudinal fascicles. That will be responsible for constriction of pupil. It will also stimulate the medial rectus that is responsible for convergence. And also there is a supply to ciliary muscle of iris as well as lens. And it will give rise to ciliary muscle of lens and circular fibers. So constriction of pupil, relaxation of ciliary muscle and medial rectus, three components. So this pathway will be a little different. And that is very well explained here. This from left eye, it will go to left occipital cortex, left frontal eye field. There will be two diversion. One to Edinburgh Vespal nucleus, from there to oculomotor, ciliary ganglia, short ciliary, which will give rise to relaxation of ciliary muscles and curvature of the lens will be increased or convexity will be increased. And one group of fiber will go to the sphincter pupillae, constriction of the pupil. And from the left phonantan field, it will go to the oculomotor, main oculomotor nucleus, from there to the motor medial rectus and that will produce convergence. So this will be the entire pathway of accommodation response. So ask the person to look at the distant object and then look at the near object. If both pupil constricts and there is a convergence, we call convergence response or near response or accommodation response is preserved. This will be affected in many different conditions may be affected at the level of supranuclear level or infranuclear level. At present, we are not discussing in detail. When we come to the third cranial nerve, third, fourth cranial nerve examination, we'll be discussing in detail. So this we call is a accommodation response or accommodation reflex. Pathway is second cranial nerve and efferent is again third cranial nerve. So convergence with constriction of pupil and convexity of the lens together we call that as convergence response or near response or accommodation response so mainly two component convergence and constriction of the pupil so in accommodation response relaxation by gazing the distant objects and then shifting to the near object you will get two components, mainly convergence of the eyeball and pupillary constriction and change in the lens thickness, which we cannot examine. So again, you can see this is at the distant object here. 
there is a convergence with constriction of the pupil so convergence reflex or accommodation reflex or near reflex is preserved so that is characteristic so near response will be normal it will be absent if there is a damage to the brain stem or interconnecting fiber between third fourth and sixth cranial nerve in that case the near response will be affected this will also happen if there is a damage to those connections and that will happen in home adis pupil also in case of ar pupil etc when we come to that we'll be discussing that particular part there is one reflex called as a lid closer reflex where it is a non specific term when you blink usually when you close the eye meiosis with blinking constricts constrict transiently with blinking and absent in darkness maybe darkness reflex if you get a homolateral meiosis with lid closure it will be significant that there is some pathology which is occurring there is also called as mitriasis on corneal touch this is called oculopupillary reflex means when you just give a stimulus to the cornea you can have pupillary dilatation that is mitriasis on touch to the cornea that is called oculopupillary reflex usually we never try this there is a darkness reflex from light to the dim light abolition of the light reflex relaxation of the sphincter pupillae and contraction of the dilator pupillae will occur that is darkness reflex there is something called as a psychosensory reflex that is dilatation of pupil in response to sensory or psychic stimulus classical example fear dilation response to a psychological stimulus so we end here now we are going to the different types of pupil so normally we know that in a normal room light both pupil are equal and medium size in a bright light both pupil will be pin point in a dark room both pupil will be dilated so we usually use the word if they are unequal pupil we call that as anisocoria and we look at the size to label at meiosis or mitriasis so we try to compare and for comparison usually such charts are available or measures are available by which you can roughly measure the pupillary size right from 2 to 8 so you can measure that i'll be directly going to different pupil that is argal robertson pupil etc will be going through this some of those are asked as a short note ar pupil is asked as a short note horner syndrome is asked home edis pupil you can it can be asked in oral exams so these are two two common another is marcus gun pupil these are usually not common so we'll be going through ar pupil this is a pupillary pathway we already discuss this is marcus gun pupil so one common short note can be asked is meiosis it is also called meiosis or pinpoint pupil or constricted pupil or microcoria the classical example of bilateral pupil which has meiotic or we call microcoria classical in case of opium morphine pethidine addiction or toxicity so this will be one of the classical example of drug toxicity either with opium morphine or pethidine or once in a while in tamsulosin also can produce bilateral pinpoint pupil in barbiturate addiction also you can have little amount of pinpoint pupil in pontine hemorrhage on the side when there is a damage you can have a pinpoint pupil on that side but a massive hemorrhage in a pons can produce bilateral pinpoint pupil bilateral hornus will produce bilateral pinpoint but if it is unilateral it will be always on the same side organophosphorus will be bilateral argyle robertson pupil will be also 
by and large by and large it will be unilateral but sometime you if it damages both side you can have a bilateral pinpoint pupil pilocarpine drops when it is utilized bilateral pupil will be pinpoint and in a case of a long standing homeadis it can be bilateral pinpoint but classical example always remember in case of organophosphorus poisoning opium opium morphine pethidine and in tamsulosin barbiturate poisoning and pontine hemorrhage while unilateral classical example is unilateral horner syndrome so microcoria pilocarpine drops horner syndrome classical do remember while megalocoria large pupil very commonly you will come across in home adis pupil we call midriatic pupil or person has use the drops which are for dilation or in case of a third cranial lobe palsy you can have dilated pupil will be coming through that so fully dilated pupil or midriasis or megalocoria classical in case of a dhatura poisoning cocaine addiction homeatropine eye drops particularly prior to eye checkup atropine overdose and when the person has got brain death bilateral pupil are dilated and fixed very frequently you can come across third cranial lobe palsy very commonly it will be unilateral third cranial lobe palsy homeadis pupil or adystonic pupil traumatic midriasis following an atropine drops or also other drugs sympathomimetic drugs particularly cocaine which is very frequently utilized in case of a optic nerve damage on the same side you will have a dilated pupil and also in case of a third cranial lobe palsy on the same side you will have a dilated pupil and once in a while in case of a head injury also you can have a bilateral dilated pupil and particularly in case of hernia uncle herniation alkyl robertson pupil is quite frequently asked as a short note and this thing can be asked in your oral as all as a short note so argal robertson pupil means irregular shape pupil by and large they are small size always remember ar accommodation response preserve so light near dissociation so usually it is bilateral so you can have a bilateral pinpoint pupil absence of pupillary reflex dilation in response to dark and midriatic so pupil will not dilate to darkness and midriasis so sympathetic stimulation cannot produce dilation and the most common cause of argal robertson pupil is neurosyphilis and there is another disorder we call wernicke's encephalopathy so these two are the most common and we always use the word accommodation response preserve and light reflex absent light reflex absent so that will be we will label that as ar pupil remember another disease with a light near dissociation will be homeadis pupil diabetes mellitus and there is one syndrome of a brain stem damage we call paranoid syndrome so this three will be additional condition so argal robertson pupil very commonly is because of neurosyphilis small irregular pupil direct pupillary reflex absent accommodation re response preserved so always remember a a accommodation response p present light reflex absent l r a light reflex absent so light reflex is absent and there is a poor response to midriatic that is typical in syphilis diabetes midbrain lesion we have already mentioned one syndrome that is paranoid syndrome and also in case of uh, multiple sclerosis also there will be damage and also in case of a home adis pupil so that is and this syphilis was very common in prostitutes so it was also described as a prostitute pupil so that is typical argal robertson pupil so we usually say accommodation reflex present pupillary reflex absent a r p p r a pupillary reflex absent so 
pupil do not react to light pupil will react briskly to accommodation and pupil will be irregular because of iridocyclitis we skip this particular part of accommodation response and that ar pupil features we already mentioned that pinpoint pupil irregular in shapes does not react to light dilate pupil uh, dilate poorly to midriatics like atropine or physosigmine and irregular in size does not react to light bilateral but may be asymmetrical bilateral involvement but asymmetrical and accommodation response is preserved there is something called as a reverse argal robertson pupil which will occur in diphtheria or tumor at caprora quadrigemina forget about all those where accommodation response in this accommodation response on one pupil is absent so this is just opposite so what is opposite of this accommodation response will be absent that will be typical in case of reverse argal robertson pupil so in this accommodation reflex on the pupil is absent home edis pupil it is also called myotonic pupil it is classically seen in myotonica congenita or it is also called as ad syndrome where you will have unilateral dilated pupil by and large it is unilateral so you get midriasis pupillary reflex is absent or it is a poor response to pupillary response that is pupil will constrict very sluggish poor response to convergence so accommodation reflex is also affected so this will be a characteristic of dilated pupil with accommodation response absent so remember that is characteristic in home edis pupil so constriction with a weak pilocarpy so if you add a pilocarpy there is slight constriction and that will happen very classical in case of a home edis pupil this is a congenital which is myotonica congenita and in that you have got a reduced tendon reflex knee jerk and ankle jerk are reduced and person will also have a orthostatic hypotension so when you come across a eye findings with reduced tendon reflex like knee and ankle and there is an orthostatic hypotension suspect home edis pupil so that is typical of home edis pupil so this is comparison of ar pupil and home edis pupil here bilateral irregular this is usually unilateral and dilated pupil accommodation response is slow and prolonged while here accommodation response is quick light reflex will be absent here affected pupil is initially larger than it is normal of compared to opposite side and become smaller over the time and remains tonically constricted that is very characteristic of a home edis pupil so this is argal robertson pupil this is home edis pupil comparison you can go through you at your leisure time this is in detail you can go through if you are interested you can go through you so i am having a pause for a while you can have a pause go through in detail this is continuity part so comparison of argal robertson pupil small irregular does not react to light reacts to accommodation while myotonic is dilated pupil poor response to light and convergence and it will constrict with with pilocarpy while this will not dilate this will not dilate to a dilators home edis pupil will be also associated with orthostatic hypotension and reduced tendon reflex while this is classically seen in syphilis diabetes two common conditions horner syndrome i have already uploaded will give you three classical findings ptosis and hydrosis and meiosis it is also associated with anophthalmos unilateral flushing of the face absence of ciliospinal reflex does not dilate with cocaine and there is slight elevation of lower eyelid we call reverse ptosis 
already I have uploaded Horner syndrome separately. You can go through at leisure time. So entirely full picture of Horner's is explained here. So I'll skip all this. At your leisure time, you can go through. You can have a pause and you can go through. Usually ask as a short note. There is something called as a reverse Horner's, which is also called as a porphor dopatic. That is unilateral midriasis, face flushing, hyperhidrosis. This will be opposite of hornus. Hence, it is called reverse hornus. And this is because of transient sympathetic system overactivity. And that gives rise to what we call the reverse hornus. So, we are almost compared light reflex, no near light dissociation. So when you get dissociation of light reflex and near reflex, it is classical in case of AR pupil and home edis pupil. Do remember that. So if one reflex is preserved, one is absent. You always look for home edis pupil and Argyle Robertson pupil. And if one is affected or both are affected, Third cranial nerve palsy, most common. Do remember that. So, dissociation will be very characteristic in case of a AR pupil and home edis pupil. Light near dissociation. We forget about that. This is called leukocoria, where you get central part white. This is very classical in case of a congenital cataract, retinoblastoma. These two are very, very common. Warny case, hemianopic pupil. This is caused by division of optic tract. Results in a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. And that is very frequently seen in Warny case, hemianopic pupil. So, just out of way. Then there is something called as a Hutchison pupil. This is due to compression of the third cranial nerve which is due to meningeal hemorrhage at the base of the brain. And what does it produce? Dilation of one pupil when the other pupil is constricted. So, this is anisocoria which will be produced because of damage to the optic nerve and that is given a name Hutchison pupil because of meningeal hemorrhage. So, there will be compression of the optic nerve and dilation of one pupil when the other pupil is constricted, unilateral pupillary dilatation. That is peculiar. These are all other odd type of pupil. If you are interested, you can go through. There is something called as a paradoxical pupil. That is interesting reaction. Normally, pupil should constrict when the light is shown. Instead of that, if pupil dilates, it is called paradoxical pupil. And when light is off, pupil constrict. This is sometime very very rare you can come across in a normal person also there is something called as a hippus pupil where irregular dilating and constricting movements are observed and this will happen in a myasthenia gravis regarding a ciliospinal reflex we have already discussed in a Horner syndrome but one word whenever you stimulate the skin in a neck by pinching and if you get dilation of the pupil on the same side that is ciliospinal reflex is present if it is absent means sympathetic damage and that is one of the part in case of a Horner syndrome this we can skip over so I end my lecture here thank you all for taking out time I know that your time is valuable this is a very long topic so see you in next lecture if you like this lecture, please don't forget to press button like, subscribe and you can share with your friends. See you in next lecture.